The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. tell you what, I could hear the Lord as clear as I've ever heard him. Uh, we're, we're basically, we've got our marching orders from God, and uh, we say things a different way, but the message is, is clearly clean, pure, and simple. It's basically the time is, and this is not a pun for full stature ministries, but it's time to grow up. The church hasn't even begun to see the kind of exercise, the kind of authority that it really has. And if you want to see someone who studied the the dark side and saw the authority that the church has, but also saw that many people uh, are not operating anywhere near the authority that has been invested in them through their salvation experience. That's the unfortunate part. And so to me, the, the, the sermon for this morning was easy. Um, it's going to be a battle cry, and it's going to be a, a continual message uh, that will unfold over the, um, over the months and years. This message is called No Ground. No Ground. That's going to have to be the church's battle cry. No Ground. Because if we've learned anything in the demonic realm and in the soulish realm uh, for believers, you give place to the devil is your downfall. And you haven't been even begun to be militant enough to guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. But you need to be taught how to guard, how to advance, how to literally stand in the place of your jurisdiction. And, and so, I don't know, I, I feel like there's a kratos anointing. That means dominion authority. We preached on that some weeks ago. That theme is going to continue to flow. It's flowing like a river. It's time for the believers to stand up. This is the day of the saints or the day of the priesthood of the believer. But you're going to have to have the title alone isn't going to do anything. It's going to be how you impact the world around you. The kind of victory that you are personally living in. And uh, so I believe, I want to read this to you from the Message Bible, because sometimes you hear a different translation, it comes across a little better. The world is unprincipled. Do you believe that? It's a dog-eat-dog world out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way. Never have, never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing and manipulation. They are for demolishing that entirely massive corrupt culture. Do you believe there's a corrupt culture out there? Then we've got weapons. We use our powerful God tools. We have this in all of our module training, this verse. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers that are erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought, and emotion and impulse. Tell me you haven't been taught that. Fitting every loose thought, runaway thinking, every emotion and every choice, every impulse into a structure of a life that is shaped by Christ. Our tools, 2 Corinthians 10, our tools are ready and at hand for clearing the ground, there's that word, clearing the ground of every obstruction and building our lives of obedience unto maturity or full stature. That's pretty much the mandate. But I'll tell you what, God is basically saying that our battle cry for desperate lovers of God is going to have to be, I'm not giving him any more ground. I'm telling you seriously, you want to pray for an awakening. It's not something that's just going to fall on people who are basically living and whining and complaining. I saw a marquee on a church down the street and sometimes Sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're not. This one was serious. I think this one was serious. It says, it's time to be a fountain, not a drain. Don't you like that idea? We just preached on that a week ago about my people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the fountain, and they've hewn for themselves broken cisterns that hold no water. They drain, they leak. They don't even hold anything. And just like a third grader once told us, there's no living water in your head. 
You have to, a man of understanding goes down into that well. A man of understanding draws it out. So we need to sink into in order to be clothed and pull on the good things. But I'm telling you what the word of the Lord is. It's time to grow up, time to grow up. I really believe there's been some wishy-washy Christians that in the days ahead are going to suddenly realize that your Bible knowledge is not maturity, that you cannot mature beyond your emotional maturity. If your emotions are being tossed to and fro, you've given ground to the enemy, then he has permission to torment. He has permission to work on you. And I believe the battle cry has got to be no ground. Because even Jesus himself said, the devil comes, but he what? Has nothing in me. And we've been giving place to him out of lazy thinking, lazy living. And actually, when, uh, we, when we talked with John, what did he say? He says, I've got a bone to pick with the church. He said, they're basically, they're basically not really passionate about defeating the enemy. And they're lazy and they give ground. And the enemy can only use what you give him. He says when, when he was in uh, uh, all of that demonic stuff, he said he basically, he said he'd find the weakness and then co- capture you by it. He would then literally find that weakness and then exploit you. I'll tell you what, that's a picture of what the enemy does to anybody. So instead of looking at your weaknesses as, oh, well, I'm only human. No, you're not only human. Did you know Jesus gave us the example of what a human was supposed to be like? Huh? He was both God and he walked as a man under the authority of the spirit. And so that's what human looks like. So don't be using it as an excuse for your shortcomings. That battle cry for desperate lovers of God needs to be no ground. Let's say that one time anyway. No ground. Now, by the time you're done, we'll see if you're really committed to to really do it. All right. But uh, here's, here's what I'm saying. There's going to be a priesthood of believers that we're entering into the day of the saints to where fivefold ministers are supposed to be equipping you to stand on your own two feet and not be leaning heavily on other people. Remember, what are you? You're either a fountain that can pour out to others and you can't give something you don't have, or you're a drain. Are you a fountain or a drain? Are you needy, 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 and you got to pull on other people? Or do you say, I belong to God, and I've got a lot to give? Out of that overflow, I'm going to be one that is a blesser. All right? But I'm telling you what, the, there's, there's, there's solutions for those needy people, but they have to make up their mind. Do they want to have their own relationship with Jesus? Do they want to be strong? Do they want to do exploits? And I know that I know God's basically saying we're entering in a time to where God's going to be drawing only serious believers to be equipped like an army because we can't, we can't have needy people who won't stand on their own two feet to, to accomplish anything for the kingdom. They really can't. Is there healing for them? Absolutely. But you can have as much of Jesus as you want. If you want somebody else's Jesus, that's probably not going to work. Yes. You're going to have to have your own relationship and stand on your own two feet. But here's a, just out of Matthew 18. Uh, when God revealed this to me one time, we were traveling in Connecticut. My spiritual father preached on Matthew 16, and I knew I was going to preach on Matthew 16. And I didn't want to because he just preached on it, and I didn't want to try to. And the next thing I know, I preached uh, a little bit on Matthew 16. He went back to Pennsylvania and sent me a CD. He preached my message to his congregation almost verbatim. And that, that, was, that was an honor. So I believe that to honor Dennis, but what was an honor was there was something in that message that's cutting edge, and it's still cutting edge. And it's, it's the priesthood of believers. What do they look like? And Matthew 16 outlines it. I want to just give you real quickly seven attributes to a priesthood, radical lover of God who is in militant mode. And what are the qualifications? Number one, it's going to be how you answer this question. Who do you say I am? Remember Jesus asked that? Who do you say I am? Is it I know about God or I am intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood? It's going to be criteria number one is it can't be mom's relationship with God. It's got to be your own relationship with God. Or you just know a bunch of information and there's not enough anointing on that to accomplish anything in your life. You'll be just a tumbleweed. The second one is 
Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. It's going to be someone who has firsthand revelation of the love of the Father. You're going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're a son and a daughter. And you're going to have your own no-so, not somebody because they told you that's what the Bible says. You're going to walk in a relationship that I belong to Him. God is my Father, and I'm a son or a daughter of the Most High God, and I am what I am by the grace of God, and I like me. I belong, therefore I I've got a lot to give. It's going to have to be intimate knowledge. It's going to have to be a real relationship. The third element, Simon, I no longer call you Simon, but I call you Peter, a rock. You know what you need? You need changed. Your information, if it's not changing you, is dead. It's dead letter. And God's basically saying, I want to see some name changes, but the name change, you don't get a name change unless there's a character change. Unless there's an internal transformation, there's no change. When God uses a name, that name has the embodiment of the nature in it. So if he says Simon, which means like a reed tossed in the wind, you are no longer a reed tossed in the wind. You are a rock. You've got stability. That name change means I'm going to put that in you. Because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven revealed this to you. How do you like these qualifications? After the name change, God also says, I will build my church. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm tired of your agendas and I'm tired of your activities. I'm tired of your self-promotion. I'm going to build my church, but I can only build my church. I only can will and work through whoever will let me will and work. We're not even into the message yet. This is just a precursor of the qualification. Just in case you think you've arrived, right? Huh? I will build my church. You are the church. It's not a building. I will build in you. If you yield, surrender, and allow me to will and to do according to my good pleasure. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. That's when he's going to build his church. You don't build his church. You don't build anything. As a matter of fact, when the Asians, uh, a group of Asians came over that were really on fire for God, and they came to America, it was kind of amusing. They looked at all the big church buildings and structures that were beautiful on the outside and dead on the inside, and they said, it's amazing what the American church can build without the Holy Spirit. (laughs) And that was coming from pure hearts who knew God. They also knew that we could build great things. God said, that's not what I'm talking about, the church. When I build my church, I'm going to build people that stand on their own two feet. I will build, not you. The next thing goes, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. You know what that means? It's an unstoppable kingdom. You are as you walk in the kingdom, an unstoppable advancing kingdom. Let the peace of God rule and crush the enemy beneath your feet because the prince of peace and the kingdom of his peace, his shalom, is going to expand and it's continuing to expand wherever you take it. But if you don't have it, you're not taking it anywhere, are you? If you're living in low-grade anxiety all day long, you're not advancing the kingdom. You're basically in the wrong kingdom. Fear is the wrong kingdom. Fear in sickness, disease, and unforgiveness and toxic emotions are the devil's kingdom. And we verified that. Huh? Those, those are the footholds that even those satanic people use against believers. They exploit your weaknesses and they say, ah, there's legal ground. We can exploit them and torment them. Come on, it's time for believers to quit being tormented. God said 365 times, one for every day of the year. Fear not. We're going to have to get radically allergic to fear. We've got believers that are spirit-filled and highly gifted who still battle fear. Enough's enough. There's going to have to be a battle cry, no, no ground. I need to be allergic to fear. If God says, fear not, he's certainly not saying, well, you don't understand, God, how strong it is. Well, God, you don't understand my circumstances. You don't understand. What did he say? He said, fear not. At some point, you're going to have to depend more on God and less on your your explanation, your rationalization. This kingdom is unstoppable. And God says, and not only that, but I'm going to give you keys. At least this priesthood of believers that are going to be militant anyway, overcomers, the day of the saints are going to be like this. I'm going to give you keys. And basically, you're going to forbid or permit. You're going to to forbid the devil to get place, and you're going to open the 
the gates to allow the flow of God to flow out of your life and touch the lives of other people. Binding and loosing is primarily permit or forbid if it's properly applied. And lastly, when you open or permit to God and you shut to hell, you shut the door to any access or any permission through how? Sickness and disease, unforgiveness, and any toxic emotion. And like Jennifer shared, 90% of sickness and disease is emotionally based, so why not start at the core? If you've got sickness or disease in your body, pray for it, but by golly, start shutting the doors to your, to your self-judgments toward uh, fear and anxiety and opening up to the torment that's working against your physical body, and you're giving the enemy permission to torment you. I'll tell you what, it's time that we get up and, and start taking the kind of authority that God's had for us. You know, you know what the world would like? Remember it says the world don't play. The world would like the church to be these nice people who stay in a corner and don't make any waves. And I don't know what you would call that, but I'm sure there's plenty of people complying. It's like a club. I don't want to be a club. If I want to join a club, I'd go join some other club. But I'm part of a member of the body of, of Jesus, and I want to extend that kingdom, and that's my mission, that's my destiny, and that's my purpose. And if, if the enemy has any ground in me, then I'm basically just being drained. Do you want to be a fountain, or do you want to be a drain? I should probably go down the church down the street with the marquee and say, God, I want to preach your message out there. <laughs> but anyway... But lastly, that church, after you've been given keys, you're going to begin to impact society. Do you think society needs impacting? What did we read in the message? The world is unprincipled. It's doggy dog out there. The world don't fight fair. Hey, the fairness doctrine has to die in you people too. I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm getting a little weary of some of the people's complaining. Um, it's not fair. Who said it was? <laughs> There's no fairness doctrine. You see, you can see what the, some great thinkers have done with the fairness doctrine. They've got it to where they start calling the ditch the road and the road the ditch. It isn't fair. And you know what? The favor of God's not fair. Amen. When God pours his favor out on you, that ain't fair to all those unbelievers that don't have Jesus. But they could if they wanted to. I'm telling you, God's basically saying these tools aren't for marketing or manipulation. They're for demolishing that entirely massive, corrupt culture. He's, not th that we're not talking about somebody else. We're talking about you. You are supposed to be using your God tools to smash that corrupt culture. And I, mean, I, mean, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. I just wanted someone to comfort me in my affliction. Now I want to afflict the comfortable now. We don't want to comfort you in your affliction only. We want to put the armor on you. It's hard to put armor on wounded people though, isn't it? This don't fit. This hurts. Now we're going to get into the message, all right? No ground. No ground we're going to learn to stand our ground, and then we're going to learn to take ground. How's that? But first and foremost, you've got to understand that the, the weakness before we can put that kind of armor on you to be the kind of man and woman of God that he wants you to be, we're going to have to find out that this battle cry, no ground, is more than just saying it. You can't just say it. You're going to have to live it. You know, to know is to love God passionately and be allergic to anything, not him. Let's simplify this message today. The hell flags, the way we teach them, hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. They didn't even come into the world until man was rejected from the garden for sin. So toxic emotions all belong to the evil kingdom, and they all came rushing in at the moment that man sinned. When man sinned, those toxic emotions opened the door for the enemy to torment. And man tries all his clever little schemes to hide it, suppress it, Stuff it, rationalize it away. Say, we don't need those feelings. Oh, well, let's be fair. <laughs> hmm? But basically, God's saying, 
there's but one purpose, that you might know him, that you might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his person. So give no place to the devil needs to be our battle cry. You know, to give no ground, no place, no foothold. In our day, I'm sure they don't do it anymore, but in my day when I was young, uh, I think like in the 50s, that used to be standard procedure for door-to-door salesmen. They used to call them the fuller brush salesmen. Anybody hear of a fuller brush salesman? I don't even know. Probably not, none of you too old enough. But this tactic was that when they knocked on the door and you opened the door, they put their foot in the door so that you couldn't even slam the door on their face. Jennifer just pull a gun, so I don't know. It probably, it probably wouldn't work at our house, would it, Jennifer? <laughs> and then she'd drag them inside to make sure it was <laughs> they were totally in the house. Bless her. Those watching by Ustream, they're going, what is he talking about? But seriously, that was an old tactic. They used to say, put the foot in the door so that they, they, they're, you're going to squeak out your little sales pitch before you're... Better wear some good steel toed shoes for that kind of job. Slam the door. They had a foothold. Do you see what that's like? That means that's all the devil needs is a crack. We learned that from John, didn't we? He only needs a crack to torment you. Now, this was a high priest that people in Satan worship, where people came from South America and others to pay tribute to his ability. That's how high up he was. And when he said, uh, Satan came into his room. People said, you mean demons? He go, no, I mean Satan. All right? But I'll tell you what, the, if you want to hear about the authority as a believer, you see someone that's seen the other side. Maybe some people need to, maybe some of that torment that you're going through is, is something that you need to treat as more evil than just the way life is. I know that's right. You know? Because that's when he gets a foothold. Because you think it's necessary part of life. No, it's not. It's not a necessary part of your life, so stop it. <laughs> That's a good strategy. It's nice and simple. Just stop it. No. But here's, here's where we're going with this. To give no place or ground to the devil, no foothold. To forsake the fountain and to hewn for yourself cisterns, substitutes. They don't really work. The substitutes actually give the opportunity for torment from the enemy. So... I want you to close your eyes because, you know what, if you're going to be a fountain and not a drain, you're going to have to learn to see where is the enemy attacking you right now. There's seven thrones. We're going to have to bring this to the forefront. The first one is uh, your spirit, your very spirit, the very epicenter of where God wants to do good things. Throne number one, your spirit. What's your prayer life like? Do you make decisions that are godly decisions or do you just kind of wing it? Are you hearing from God on a regular basis or is the noise and the clatter of your own thoughts and impulses ruling? Is Jesus Lord or is there other things that are taking precedence over your spirit? Is it, I love Jesus, but I love this and I love my car and I love my boat and I love this. He must be number one in your spirit. Secondly, the throne of your mind. Are you tolerating unscriptural thoughts, not even resisting those thoughts? Because after all, they're in my head. They must be mine. And you're not even guarding your thought life. Hmm? Did you know that you have the God tools to casting down arguments and high things that exalt themselves in the knowledge of God? But are you not even applying those God tools? Are you giving ground in your thought life? Instead of saying, that's clearly not the voice of God, it's not scriptural, I don't need it. How about your emotions? Throne number three, your emotions, issues and offenses. Do you resolve things quickly or do you just suppress it and live with a grudge? I once preached a third grade message on a grudge to an adult, and I had a whole altar full of people come forward. And I took it out of a third grade reader about that when you're bitter in your heart, it grows up into be a grudge. And then the grudge sits on your shoulders and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger the longer you carry it. And all my adults needed that. So what's good for those children is good for us too, isn't it? Hmm? You hold grudges? 
You have prompt obedience, issues, and offenses. Do you let God search your heart to see if there's any, any hurt, any pain toward anybody? Do you know, no amount of repentance will work if you don't first forgive everyone, every last big and little thing. That's kind of scary, isn't it? But it says your Heavenly Father won't forgive you if you won't forgive. So don't sit there and play around and play church. Go join a club and quit church if you're really not going to mean business about making Jesus Lord of your life. The days gone by when you can get by because He's your Savior and you said a sinner's prayer and then live like the devil the rest of your life. Those days are gone. You're going to fall by the wayside. You're going to get so beat up. You don't think you have to go to church anymore. You don't think you need fellowship anymore. I've seen the reasoning minds of some of the most brilliant minds that were Christians and biblically literate once they got isolated. That's the enemy's tactic. He's smarter than you. And if he can isolate you, he can deceive you into believing just about anything, no matter how biblically literate you are. Emotions. Am I truly cleansed of offenses or have I given ground to the enemy? Throne number four. My will versus God will. When I make a choice, does the peace of God rule before I make that choice? Or do I want what I want and I want it now and I take it because I think it's a good idea? Am I the master of my soul or is Jesus Lord over the area of my will? How about my body, my physical body? Tolerating sickness or poor health practices. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if there's sickness in it, am I welcoming Jesus to heal it and staying open to that healing no matter how long it takes and never shutting down, believing that my hope is in Him, not in an outcome? Most people give up on their healing because they're hoping in an outcome. If it doesn't happen in three minutes, I, oh well, oh well. Does that sound like a life in God to you? That sounds more like a rabbit's foot. Huh? That sounds like a, what well, Jesus isn't your good luck charm. He wants a relationship to where he's Lord of your life and you live through it. I'm telling you, as God is my witness, I am positive that God is saying, I'm going to make my church. It's going to have to realize they're going to have to grow up and they're going to have to grow up quickly because I'm going to bring in a harvest and that harvest cannot be raised by the same people in the same way babies cannot raise babies effectively. I'm going to have to have mature mothers and fathers who know that they are sons unto God so that they can bring those harvests in and not just make them like themselves. We don't need a bigger nursery. We need a greater army. And God is basically saying, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and that's another thing. For people that don't say, I don't need those emotions. I got news for you. That's part of your physical body and you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you want to keep your emotions over to a side, stuffed and suppressed and not give them to Jesus. He's going to come in and cleanse that temple. He wants to cleanse it. But if he don't, you know what the enemy will do? All that stuff that you're keeping in, in the temple on the side, the enemy is going to have permission to enter into your temple. He's going to have permission to torment you because you're saying, I'm not surrendering that to God. Emotions belong to me. I'll tell you what, boyfriends and girlfriends, you might have relationships, but guess what? Your emotions belong to God before they belong to them. Right. Did you know that my emotions belong to God before it belongs to my wife? Right. My emotions are a conduit for the anointing of God to make us one. But God comes first. Your emotions belong to God. Your mind belongs to God. Your will belongs to God. And wherever it doesn't belong to God, the enemy has ground. But I'll tell you what, God is, is serious about this. He told me, I even think our relationship with Sid Roth is interesting because in 1989, I was sitting under a tree and God says, I'm going to use as a strategy, Dennis, for the end times, I'm going to, I'm going to use as a specific strategy, one new man. I'm going, to, I'm going to use that as a strategy of unity. It's going to be Jew and Gentile made one new man through Jesus. And I'm telling you what, uh, uh, Jewish believers are coming, are coming and multiplying like never before in history. That could even, at the time of the Gentiles, may be fulfilled. 
What's that mean? Huh? It means grow up quick, will you? You don't have time to be watching, observing in the skies when God's saying, I'm making myself available to whosoever. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you what, if you're going to be a serious priesthood believer, you're going to start appreciating your body and quit abusing your body. You're going to start letting Jesus be Lord of that physical body. And that includes your gifts and your talents. Hmm? Your gifts and talents is not a mark of, of character. A nature change is a mark of character. Your possessions. Throne number six. Possessions, your finances. Are you struggling in a financial area? Because quite clearly, if you're not a giver and you don't give with, a, with the right heart attitude, I promise you, you will struggle in that area because you've given the enemy permission and that you'll be pockets with holes in it. It will leak like a cistern. It'll be a drain. Take any of those seven areas where you struggle, thought life, your emotions, your will, and I promise you there's areas you refuse to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus because for you to be tormented in one of those seven thrones more than the others, you've given place. And I'm saying you've got the tools to know how to close that place. Your emotions belong to God. There's people, that, I just heard the Lord say, there's people that don't believe that. There's people that think that they can keep them to themselves. God's saying, unless you bring it to death, those emotions, they're going to sabotage your destiny. You're going to lose the things that God had planned for you because emotions control your thinking and emotions control your choices. You know what that means? You're going to think weird and you're going to make bad choices. So you better mature in those emotions. You need us. I, I believe we need to just sanctify that right now. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, my emotions belong to God. They don't belong to my husband. They don't belong to my wife. They are conduits of the love of God. And the love of God belongs to my husband and belongs to my wife. To love her as Christ loved the church. Yes, that's not carnal love. That is supernatural agape love that's flowing out to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. My emotions, there's a battle cry now. My emotions belong to God. And I'm going to be allergic to anything that's not the love of God, the love, joy, peace, or patience of God. Without God gave you emotions for the fruit of the Spirit. How much fruit of the Spirit are you walking in on any given day? Seriously, how much? Because those other things are telling me you're a walking vulnerability to torment. And no amount of repentance is going to work until you allow Jesus to forgive her in you to cleanse you from anything that's unhealthy in those emotions. Toxic emotions are from the devil's camp. So basically what God's going to learn and teach us to do is just as he said in Matthew 16. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. What you permit, you permit. What you forbid, you forbid. It's time, it's time to start forbidding a foothold and give no ground to the enemy. Don't you think? I think there's things we've been tolerating. How many are from this day forward? Seriously, from this one message, seriously, from this day, there's going to be some things you're not going to tolerate in your thought life and in your emotions and your will. Because I'll tell you what, it'll change your life. And guess what? The torment leaves and you go, why didn't I do this before? Because you bought into the devil's strategy that that's part of life. Torment is not part of life. You can feel the torment, but it doesn't have to harm you. You don't have to own it. Submit to God, resist, and he will flee. He has to flee. He has to flee, but not if he's got permission. So I'm telling you, these, your physical body is a temple of the Lord, and God wants to cleanse that temple so that he can pour living water through that temple. He wants a fountain to come forth of living water that brings healing to the sick and salvation and deliverance and healing flows you. But he's not going to be pouring clean water and foul water at the same time. You're either going to be a cistern or it's going to flow clean. Your possessions. Okay, come on. This is one of my favorite. 39 years I've watched this. People don't think you know they're doing it. But how many of you have so exalted your gifts and your callings, your material possessions, whatever, and you're, you're, you're using it as a badge of, of character development. That's not a badge of character development. Character development says that my gifts and my callings will operate even if I'm a kind of a basket case. But God doesn't, isn't hoping you become a basket case, right? 
Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy? Did I not cast out devil? Depart from me. I knew you're not. Lawlessness. He doesn't want lawlessness. What is lawlessness? Basically, you do what you want to do, but then at the same time, the enemy can use you because you're giving him ground. Now, God's basically saying your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. There's no ground in my thought life. There's no ground in my emotions, and there's no ground in my choices. I'm going to live choosing God moment by moment by moment. I want you to say, God's going to guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Guard your heart. How do you, we've got to guard in, in five, five realms of your jurisdiction. If you're going to adjudicate or rule, you need to understand where, where's your jurisdiction? Where, what did God establish you for? First of all, you. Start with you. Before you go jurisdiction anything, and before you go adjudicating anything, start by making sure Jesus is ruling in you. When Jesus is ruling in you, then you bring that uh, anointing into your family. You bring that anointing into your family, and that peace will cast out any foul atmosphere. You'll be an atmosphere changer. You know how many children we've dealt with where they go, "Uh uh-oh, dad's home. That's a terrible, terrible, terrible criteria. You know what they mean by that? The atmosphere changes when dad comes home. If you're one of those people, you need to be on your face before God because you're going to be stand before God for that atmosphere that you bring. You can say the right words and you can say all the right things. You can be biblically literate. You know, quite frankly, it doesn't mean a thing. You're in lawlessness because it's, it's, you can fool people with your words. You can fool them with your gestures, but you can't hide what emanates. And if you bring that atmosphere in, oh boy, he's home. God's going to hold your feet to the fire. But the good news is the fire will cleanse you and purify you too, won't it? Fire's good. You need the fire from the coal from the altar. And I'm telling you, it's, it's one of the most embarrassing things is that people actually think they can hide stuff. Even when I was talking with the, uh, the, the, the people before the show, the, the other two guests, they said, Christians are not that dumb. When you radiate something, they know what the, the, a good portion of Christians have enough discernment to know that you're not for real. They just don't tell you. They know that you're emanating something unclean. Hmm? They know you've got sex spirits emanating from you. Do you really think we're that dumb? We know when you're pushing and pulling on somebody's flesh. We know those things. You can tell. How many, is there a Christian in this room that if someone was kind of pushing that you couldn't feel it down here? You even have a tendency to want to go like this when they're talking? You have the spiritual equipment on the inside, but it needs to be used properly. It needs to be toward advancing the kingdom, not running from. These five jurisdictions. Look at these things. Do your homework after this message. First start in you, then your family, then your marriage, then the church, then then the business realm or the marketplace. Those are five jurisdictions that every one of you is involved in some way or another. I don't care if you're a stay-at-home mom, you're still going to be involved in those five jurisdictions. You, your family, marriage. Marriage and family are kind of similar thing, but in the Bible it gives, you, it gives you rules for the children and it gives you rules for husband and wife. Those are things that are to be taken seriously and it's to be done in the anointing. And then there's the church. That church is basically the ecclesia. And it's the bonding and the knitting together of the people of God. And if you're one of those people, even now watching by Ustream, and you don't go to church anymore because this attitude is from the enemy, but it's infiltrated the church. I love God. It's those church people I can't handle. Did you know what? He found that he got a foothold in your heart. He did. He found a way in. And you could justify it with all kinds of examples. I mean, church to me is like a soap opera. Why would people even watch soap operas? This is where the action is. You want to see all kinds of wacky stuff? (laughs) Go to church. But then you're supposed to be part of the solution. Soap operas, you just got to go, oh, too bad. (laughs) Here you can do something redemptively about it. This is where the action is. People are fun. Manifestation is good. When they manifest demonically, the question is only, is that coming or going? We want it to go. All right. 
to adjudicate or to rule in your jurisdiction is by being militant and giving no ground to the devil. Wouldn't that be good homework for us? No ground to the devil. Now, if that's our battle cry, how many think you might need some room here? How many have lazy thinking? How many tolerate thoughts that are clearly not scriptural and kind of own them? Well, it's in my head. You know, that scares me, that kind of thinking, because when I was in the factory, they scared me. I would see these guys sitting by their machine, and I'd be, I was an, a, a new employee, so I was pushing the broom, and I'm looking, they're sitting by their machine, taking a break, eating some oranges and having a coffee, and they're reading these magazines about, woman gives birth to alien. <laughs> and you know what really scared me? They go, it's got to be true, it's in the paper. It's got to be true. It's in the paper. Well, you people do it. Well, it's in my head. It's got to be true. Right? Did you know the enemy can put thoughts in your head that are not necessarily scriptural or true? And you come up with reasoning? And you know what's interesting? Intelligence. I know some people just pride themselves in their intelligence, and it's so wonderful, but the dumbest things done in this whole world are, by, are done by intelligent politicians. When you call the road the ditch and the ditch the road, it's not a matter of your intelligence. If you're a crook, if your heart doesn't change, you become a smarter crook. Yes. It doesn't really value that. Weary of people who pride themselves in their ability to reason when in reasoning is of the kingdom of the devil. If it's not inspired by the living God, your reasoning power, it makes you feel smart, but you're, you're in so much seduced into pride, you don't know any better. How am I doing? Am I, we kicking a few people out here? If you're not serious about church, go. <laughs> Glenn says, I was about to do for another kick out, kick out, the, weeding out the, the garden a little bit. <laughs> hey, Jennifer and I are serious about this. So if the battle cry is no ground, we've got to learn not to give ground. Now, let's talk about standing ground. All right. Take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand an evil day, having done all to stand. What does that mean to stand? Having done all, stand. It means no oscillation, no double mindedness. It's like I'm making my commitment that I'm not giving ground to the enemy and I'm going to stay positioned in that. I'm going to hold my heart open, hope and open. And I'm hoping in God, not an outcome because the enemy will get you there. If you're hoping in a particular, like I'm hoping everything gets better to by tomorrow because I've had such a bad day, right? You'll be disappointed tomorrow because you haven't learned anything. You haven't learned to hold the heart open till God comes through. Stand, having done all, stand. Put on the whole armor of God, but stand. Resist the enemy. Most Christians do not resist. Most They succumb because we don't like pain. But I'm telling you what, God's saying in Ephesians 6.13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in that evil day, having done all to stand. Here's what, I want to give you an example of the challenge. This is a challenge to me, but this is a challenge to you. Do you believe the new covenant is better than the old covenant? It's more powerful, greater promises? Listen to old covenant people. Old covenant people. These are, these are my heroes. Seriously, these are the people that Jennifer and I, before we really must graduated from being a newborn Christian, these were the people that I was, or were my heroes, and she did the same thing. She read books of old people from the 1600s, 1500s, 1700s, saints of God who, who lived a life with militancy. But listen to David's mighty men. I call them sons of tenacity. Oh, we need this desperately. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Adino, who lifted up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. Get a little visual of that. Just numerically, get a visual. One man, Adino, with the anointing of God, raised his spear against 800. This is not an exaggeration. This is the anointing of God. This is a beautiful Old Testament picture of what New Testament, one chase a thousand, two ten thousand, if we can get people together without giving ground to the enemy. And they stand. This is the way you stand. Eleazar, he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary. Well, most people wouldn't, they, they'd quit before their hand got weary. I'm getting tired. All right. 
smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave. That means it's stuck. <laughs> it clave unto his sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. And the people returned after him only to spoil. All right. Shema. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. That's like all those people say, I'm behind you, pastor. I'm behind you. They, they, maximum about three months, maybe. I'm behind you. I'm behind you. They're all gathered in a troop. There's a piece of ground. The people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord brought a great victory. Shema. God is present. The Lord is here. I love it. I love these heroes. Abishai lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them. Can you get a picture of these things? I got the picture of the one standing in the lentil field when all his friends went, oh, <laughs> I'll take them. Because this is what I was called for. This is my primary purpose. They were looking out for themselves. They, they called it common sense. I call it supernatural authority of Kratos dominion that I'm going to stand and occupy and then advance. Ben and I, who had done many acts, he slew, I like this, two lion-like men of Moab. Two, I wonder what they look like. Two lion-like men of Moab. He went down and also slew a lion in the midst of a pit at the time of snow. He went into a snowy pit and slew a lion. He slew two warriors from Moab who looked like lions. I think that's the lion of the tribe of Judah showing you you're like a lion, but you're not a lion. Jesus is the lion. Huh? He slew an Egyptian, a goodly man, and the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a staff, plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. Uh, if this is old covenant, what could we do under the anointing if we gave no ground, if we stood our ground and let the authority that was in us be the authority of Jesus? Hmm? For it is God who is at work to will and to perform. He wants to perform through you. Look at this. I mean, hope doesn't disappoint. Hope is open. It permits God to will and to work, doesn't it? When you keep your heart open and say, my hope is in God, I have no idea what's going on. Everybody else ran. I don't know. God's not telling me to run. God's telling me to fight. And I'm going to do the last thing he told me to say until he tells me otherwise. So you can all do whatever you want to do, but this is what I'm going to do. Is for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That kind of attitude. Hope is an open and it permits God to will and to work. It's undergirded with God's strength in our inner man. I pray that the Lord would grant you the riches of his glory to be strengthened with all might by his power in the inner man. That's where you need the strength. You don't, you don't need more truth. Unless I have a Bible study on how many angels could fit on the head of a pen. I don't know. What do you think, Ralph? I don't know. what you think. Well, then they even start an argument over it. Oh, that's just so babyish. It's like did you know that people hide behind even those biblical arguments rather than have intimacy with Jesus? They're so afraid of intimacy. That's right. They are so afraid of having a real relationship with God, they hide behind theological arguments. Deep truths. You need a deeper nature, not deeper truth. So basically God's saying now, if we learn to stand like these people stand, we're going to not just stand there forever. We're going to take ground. You ready for take ground? We give no ground, we stand our ground, and now we're going to take ground. Exousia, that means you got the badge. God gives you the authority in Jesus. You've got the badge. He's given it to you. It's in your heart. Dunamis, that's the power to kick the door down. It's like dynamite. It will accomplish the purpose against the enemy. And Kratos, that's my favorite. That's dominion authority. Preached on this a few weeks ago. Kratos is, after you say, it's me, 
priesthood of the believer under the authority of Jesus. I've been sent, and this badge proves I've been sent by God. I kick in your door, and then I take your remote from your TV. I sit in your chair, and it's my house now. Out of here. Cleanse this temple. You've been squatting long enough. Someday it's going to happen in Israel. Do you believe that? Yeah. Get them squatters out and let the people of God occupy what God had planned for them all along. Cleanse that. There's Jesus cleansed the temple. And, and I like that story in Nehemiah when he basically came to Jerusalem and discovered that the evil Eliashib, the high priest, he, you know, done, he let Tobiah, he let Tobiah preparing a room for him in the church. We don't prepare rooms for Tobiah in the church. You're the church. You don't need to repair any rooms in here for the enemy because the spirit of man is a candle of the Lord searching all the innermost rooms of the belly and you better not find any Tobias in there because if he does, God's going to kick him out. And you should want him to, right? He said, it grieved me bitterly that Tobiah was preparing a room for him in the courts of God and it grieved me. Therefore, I threw out all his household goods. <laughs> I cleaned out. So I have to, who's, who's camping out in the temple? Throw all the stuff out. Gee, sounds like my pre-salvation days when girlfriends would throw my clothes out. <laughs> Only in that case is the devil casting out the devil, right? right? It grieved me. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms. I brought back into the articles of the house of God with the grain offerings and the frankincense. I want to believe for next Sunday, I want you to bring, that this is not about money, this is about your heart. I want you to bring in an extra offering just to go above and beyond your normal giving. I don't care if it's a nickel, but just do it from the heart and say, I'm bringing something extra into the house of God. I've kicked out the enemy now, and I want, I want, my offering to be a sweet smelling fragrance unto God. You don't want to. You don't have to. Matter of fact, you don't have to kick anything evil out of your life if you don't want to either. But I'm telling you, God's cleansing and He's cleaning. Because if you're going to, how many, what I'm saying is, I want you to get the advance on the finance. I don't want to see Christians in financial trouble, and I don't want to see Christians in sickness and disease. So let's cleanse that temple if we honor it as God's temple and start welcoming him to go wherever he wants to and then say, God, if I'm giving place in some way that I don't know how, I don't want to be continually tormented in any of those seven thrones. Do you? My possessions. You know, we skipped the one throne, didn't we? Relationships. All relationships. Hmm? If you're, you got ungodly soul ties, get rid of it. Because God's trying to put something beautiful together, a tapestry of God, of knitting, greater and lesser knittings of the heart. Some people are soul tied to their jobs. It can be a person, place, or a thing. You know, I have nothing against vacations, but I can tell the character of someone who basically spends more time on their boat than they do in church. More time in vacation than they do in church. More time in recreation than they do in church. I know their priorities are off, no matter how they justify it. The only really legitimate one is the ones that are, have mandatory employment on Sunday. But apart from that, it's kind of like, it's kind of like something was lost during the charismatic movement in the name of freedom, to where we don't even take it serious anymore. I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's dishonors God. It's saying your family's really not that important. But don't think for a minute God doesn't see someone missing at the table. Don't think for a minute. He, he knows who's there and who's not there. He knows your heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So I'm telling you what, God's basically saying we need to deal with these two. If we're going to take ground, we're going to have to start with those seven thrones again, right? My spirit, I need to get back to a prayer time that means something. I need to put him first. First things first. Seek first the kingdom. Seek the king. How many have basically get sidetracked on a computer or something else? Or I slept in, so I'll just skip it. I'll pray on the run. I'm telling you, God's basically saying, let's honor him. If you can't honor him, then who are you honoring other than yourself? And I, I believe God's saying, you've got to start in the spirit. 
to cleanse your temple, you got to start by putting first things first. Secondly, your thought life. Quit entertaining and reasoning with thoughts that pop into your head. What you should do is go to the emotion behind that thought and you'll find out that it's God or not. Every thought has a corresponding emotion and that emotion is either birthed in humility and in God or it's birthed in pride and sin. This is not complicated. Your emotions, you need to break soul ties, relationships that are not healthy. You can make excuses and say you're trying to win them to the Lord, but if they're tearing you down, you're not very successful, are you? Hmm? Your will. Do you really make decisions from the place of peace, or do you do what you want to do when you want to do it and call that freedom? Do you really bring God into it so that the peace of God rules in your decision making? Is he really the umpire? Your physical body. Come on, right now, let's pray even for your physical body. I want any, you start removing these barriers and health and healing is going to start flowing to your body. Unless you hate yourself, you better start there and quit talking bad about yourself and judging yourself because you're speaking sickness to that physical body. So Father, right now I am welcoming Jesus the Messiah to rise with healing in his wings and impact every every cell, every organ, every system in this physical body. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I was bought with a price. I am not my own. I want him to have every room. Let the spirit of man be the candle of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of the belly, all the innermost rooms of the belly, as one translation says. You can go into any room in my spiritual house, God. You can go into any room, and there's nothing where I'll say, you're not allowed to enter there, God. You don't understand. I'm keeping that in myself. I have a private life, and I have a church life. Well, I'm telling you what, shine that light on that private life because it, it's in the wrong kingdom. I let them turn, start turning lights on in some of these rooms and allowing God to deal with us. So Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I offer my body a living sacrifice. Here's another one. I want to see you people not only walk in healing, but in health. And I'm believing that for this congregation that we're going to walk in an anointing of health. When other people are getting sick and catching this and that, you're going to see either quick recovery or no sickness at all. We're going to see an improvement in our overall health as we allow Jesus the healer to rise with healing in his wings. But I want you to move now to your possessions. I'll tell you what, when I gave God my first car, I felt, did you ever drive someone else's car? Doesn't that feel weird? It feels like it's not yours. You should be looking at your house, your apartment, your car, and your, all of your possessions with that same awesome feeling. Try it sometime in your prayer time. Say, this house, this furniture, this couch that I'm sitting on, it belongs to you. I'm a steward. And God, you're watching how I spend my money. You're watching how I give. You're watching what I do. You're watching who's first. You know the old saying, everybody tithes, by the way. I'm really hitting the finances today, but there's a reason for that, apparently. Because it keeps coming up, and I don't usually talk finances. You tithe, every one of you tithes. It's just a question of who's your God. Come on. If you have any income at all, 10% goes somewhere. Where does it go? Does it go back to you? Think about it. Does it go back to you? Does it go to a particular place before God? That's your idol. That's your idol. Where does it go before it goes to you, before it goes to God? Does it go to you? Does it go to a car payment? Does it go to this? There's your idol. You're going to struggle because you're giving legal ground to the enemy. How about your gifts and callings? Do you know some people are so idolatrous toward their gifts and their calling that they can never get planted and grow and mature and develop in their character because they're too busy looking to be used. Well, God says, I would like to use you, but I can't get you to sit still long enough. I would like to change your heart, but I can't get you to sit still. And lastly, that throne of relationships. I'm telling you what, there's some people, there's some relationships. I'm watching it, I'm watching it take place in a larger sense outside of this local church. 
because I spend most of my time outside of this local church with other churches and, and leaders. But you know what? I'm watching people get blessed when the lots leave. Do you remember when Abraham got blessed? He loved a lot. And he loved him with a pure love. But there came a time that he was not going to bless, be blessed until Lot departed. There are some places where separation is necessary because it's just not going to work. You can't force reconciliation. And I believe Abraham loved him to the end, but still knew that to obey God was let Lot go rather than have friction. Let him go. And after Lot departed, then God said, now we're going to fulfill what I've called you to do. Lift up your eyes and look. Look for the land. Look at the land. God wants unity. Fivefold ministers are supposed to be equipping you for the work of the ministry. Fivefold ministers are supposed to be coaches, not bosses. And if they coach you and you stand on your own two feet, you're going to be a mighty army. I've got plans for you, this, this church. You want to hear what they're going to sound like? You want to hear what you're going to sound like? People aren't going to recognize you. You're going to be like Jennifer. You're going to be so changed and transformed. They're going, well, didn't I used to know you? You're going to be an army of champions. How many want to be an army of champions? How many want to say, I want to take ground for a change? Because the promise God gave me, the strategy for the end times, was going to be the same as Gideon. I'm going to take clay pots. I'm going to put the torch of my fire on the inside of them. And in the midst of the enemy's camp, I'm going to... Anyone who can break out of that soulish rule and that pot can be broken, that light's going to shine, and you're going to scatter and confuse the enemy instead of the enemy confusing the believers. I'm weary of believers who have all of the tools, all of the equipment being confused by the enemy when you should be confusing the enemy because he doesn't know how to operate in the fruit of the Spirit. If you operate in the fruit of the Spirit, you confuse the enemy every time. There's no comprehension and there's no weapon formed against you that could possibly prosper when you're in the fruit of the Spirit. That peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. It's not passive, it's powerful. Here's what you're going to look like. The army of champions. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. They march, each one, straight ahead on his way, and they don't break ranks. Joel 2. Joel 2. They don't break ranks. Isn't that nice? That means, that means they, they've got a commitment to work together, and they are interdependent, and they're not all defeated by being interdependent. Weak people are defeated by interdependence. Rugged individual people that are no more than really slightly more mature than a sickly dependent person. They march, each one straight ahead. Neither does one thrust upon another. They walk everyone his path. They've got relationship one toward another. They walk in a forgiveness lifestyle. They burst through and upon the weapons, yet they are not wounded. They do not change their course. They burst through and upon the weapons, yet they are not wounded and do not change their course. He can hurt you, but he can't harm you. Be of good cheer, for in this world you have tribulation, but I've removed its ability to harm you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. That has to mean when you're wearing or put on, sink into the whole armor of God. Then you stand. No weapon formed against that will prosper. They leap upon the city. They run upon the wall. They climb up into the houses. They enter into the windows like a thief. If you're one of these kind of people, I'll open the front door to you myself. You won't have to go into the window. I like these kind of people. The earth quakes before them and the heavens tremble and the Lord utters his voice before his army for his host is very great and they are strong and powerful, those who execute God's word. They that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Let's have the worship team back up here. I want to sing that spirit break out because it's time for you to break out. It really is. And, and Daniel 11.32 basically says, that they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. I want to read, I want to read your destiny, and it's coming forth at such a time as this, and it's in Daniel chapter 7. If you're a note taker, write this down, because this is your destiny. Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. Listen to the plan that was written in Daniel against you a long time ago. 
it says he's going to speak pompous words against the most high God. And he will try to wear out the saints of the most high God. That's stress. Grow up. Quit living in stress. Let the peace of God rule. He shall intend to change times in the law. The saints will be given into his hand for a time, times and a half. But the court will be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom, this is verse 27, the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people the saints of the Most High God. We are living in the day of the saints. This is not apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Let's get beyond getting prophetic words. Let's get beyond apostolic networks. Let's get beyond these things. Equip the saints for your days arising and the priesthood of the believer is going to start. There's going to be a marching that's going to come forth. We will always lead and need leaders, but we need to grow up and be the army that God intended you to be. Quit being sniveling ch children in a congregation looking for a handout. When in reality God's saying, I want you to put a hand out and push back the powers of darkness and snatch those who are literally going into the pits of hell and bring them out. So Father, we thank you that the kingdoms of this world and the greatness of the king, that the day of the saints is approaching us, that this is the day that we're living in, the day of a militant approach to the things of God. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.